Hello and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. I'm your host for today, Priscilla Charles, and today I'm joined in Studio 2 by Alberto Ferra. Uh, Alberto is the user research manager at Vodafone. You're very welcome today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for joining us on the show. And uh, without further ado, let's let's get started and and get to know you a little bit better for for myself. Or we've I, we've seen each other at events uh, virtually most recently. And for our audience, you know, who wouldn't know you yet, uh, so um, you are um, an experienced public speaker. And you know, and featured on multiple technical and design conferences around the world. Uh, you've also delivered an inspiring keynote at a Fingerboard Forum event uh, uh, in London, where you discussed bringing localization and UX together. And uh, you also attend a number of Fingerboard Forum events uh, throughout the years, including the recent Fingerboard Awards. So tell me, uh, what do you look forward to in attending these events? So. In terms of attending the global events, I think that one of the, the key um, advantages that you have in terms of the diversity of the audience that you attract and also the core interest in actually learning from a decentralized multicultural perspective, I think that the work that, that you do is, it, it epitomizes what localization should be about and the fact that you're bringing in other disciplines like for example, UX um, into the discussion just shows that there's a, a much bigger awareness of what a product entails, which is not just the localization aspect, but the whole chain that delivers something to the end customer. Um, and coupled with the fact that, of course, your buffets and your events are usually of huge quality in terms of the in terms of the the conditions, and um, I think that. Uh, amongst the nicest events that, I, that I've attended. So that's definitely a major plus. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, we're delighted you can join us for these events. And uh, and this is indeed what we try to do, uh, bringing um, different people you know, from the industry and touch on specific topics that can be a help to anyone. Uh, so thank you. So now I'd like to discuss um, your journey up to your current role at Vodafone. I understand you studied uh, modern languages first and literature at the Universidad de, of Porto. And then, uh, then you uh, moved on to various roles as project manager and UX researcher. So what led you to specialize in the field of uh, UX design? Was it always an interest uh, at heart initially? Um, I think it's a long story. Um, once you get into what drives you, um, then the field that you're in isn't necessarily the, the key factor. Mm -hmm. um, because in my case, I broadly come from a humanities, cultural studies background. Um, and I was always um, interested in, in different subjects in mm -hmm. psychology and ecology and uh, different aspects of um, the human sciences, so to speak. Um, and then going into technology, which was my other great love uh, in terms of field, um, bringing these two together just made sense initially that localization would be a field that I would be um, learning the ropes, so to speak. And being that close to the production line, let's say, of our product. So I was quite lucky in, in getting uh, an international experience as well at first um, to move to from Portugal. Um, at the age of 24, 24 25, mm -hmm. um, moved straight into Germany and different um, cultural setting and a different cultural um, environment as well in terms of corporate environment. And being that close to uh, the production environment of a software product um, really emphasized some of the key frustrations that um, localization engineers and and staff usually have which is they, they said at the end of the chain there is a heavy rigorous process behind it quite often there's not enough support on the product development um, side to content which is one of the key things that people would experience in this and that made me actually reverse engineer um my my trajectory, my professional trajectory, so to speak, um, because 
it became clear that I was um, much more suited to being in the design part where, where effectively the product starts um, in order to make those kinds of recommendations that would then enable localization to be much better impl implemented or much more easily at least. Um, so in this case, I kind of reverse, I, I would say that I started from a very narrow focus and then reverse engineered it to mm -hmm. what, um, what goes into a product and how do you actually improve a product with a view on somebody using it. So then it became clear. Um, so from a design perspective that you need to base it actually on what you know of your audience, which is you know what content should be in, in the end anyway. And from design, then I moved into research. And the research part really is about understanding your audience. And so it's a kind of a different approach where I started in a very narrow focus and then worked my way upstream. Yeah. Um, and my driver was always to understand um, how to make better products, but fundamentally understand if we're providing something to an audience, to a set of people that would be using that product, that we need to do it in a much more integrated way and holistic uh, way. So that's why I moved um, from cultural studies into vocalization into eventually research, which is kind of bringing it full circle because um, qualitative research was part of my master's and was part of my uh, background. So now I'm using that in research for design, so it's um, it just shows that you can repurpose and rework your your professional trajectory if you just sidestep some sometimes from your, where you're at. Absolutely, yeah, and it sounds like it really is well your position, what you do, um, is um, the proof that all of your skills, everything helped you uh, to get where you were and gives you a better understanding on how to improve the user experience for people all around the world, um, uh, which is really important uh, when you localize, of course, the product, knowing the locale. So thank you for that. And I, I'd like to move on to your current role at Vodafone. So we're mentioning the organization where, uh, again, you are the user research manager, the organization based out of London. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the organization for anyone who wouldn't be familiar with Vodafone, I'm sure, although I'm sure many of us are, and, uh, and also about your current role there? Sure. So Vodafone is one of the biggest internet and mobile network providers in the UK. Um, we basically have markets um, around the world uh, where we uh, act as mobile providers on the domestic scale as well. Um, obviously from the point of view of what my team does, uh, so we provide a link to the end customer in the sense that we focus quite uh, specifically on the digital experience. And what happens in this case is that whereas you have a lot of um, work, research work that goes into, you know, taking up calls at the call center and analyzing the content of those calls, or what happens in store when people go to buy a new phone. Mm -hmm. um, those types of research are in the scope of what we do, but we don't necessarily analyze those data sets. We focus quite concretely on the websites, apps. And what we try to do basically is to understand what we might be uh, doing wrong or not so well um, in order to provide people with as streamlined and easy an experience as possible. So we conduct qualitative and quantitative research. So basically we do interviews, workshops, surveys, um, different forms of research. We did eye tracking for a while. We'll, we'll restart that soon. Um, so we also use um, different aspects of um, galvanic skin response, so basically tracking biometrics to understand people's response to a specific site or image. Um, and why we do all that is basically because we like to triage the results in order to understand because in order to understand a problem better because one of the key problems with research is if you go at it with one approach and if you just replicate that approach there is a higher tendency that those results will be will be the same time and time again whereas if you use a different approach or a different methodology um, parallel to that then you can see if the results are or not uh, just the result of what method you use. So 
basically my team works across these quadrants and we focus on the digital work, but basically what we try to do is tell the product owners and designers, this is what your customers need yeah. and we should be doing more towards that. Okay, very interesting. And I wonder with the, the pandemic, um, is there any type of a specific research or method uh, that stood out uh, that helped your team analyze better and understand maybe customers' needs? Yes. So obviously with COVID, we had to take several precautions because a lot of our work was done in person. Okay. Um, so we would literally invite people over to a room and we would interview them or show them something mm -hmm. uh, in, in person. So we would do this um, in the office. And we had to stop that, which meant most of our interviews moved to a remote capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but also in terms of COVID, we, we noted that in terms of this type of remote research, that things were, there was a different etiquette, there's a different um, availability as well. So the research continued unabated, but people's habits also changed. Um, so we saw that there were different purchasing habits and, for example, one of the key changes is mobile data, for instance, used to be yeah. much uh, higher consumption yeah. than it is right now, um, or that it was anyway until a few months ago, because people are mostly at home and they use the Wi-Fi data rather than the mobile data. Okay. So some changing habits and we had to adapt as, as a company to that and also from a research perspective, look into these. Um, but I would say uh, in terms of the more in-person methods, we definitely had to adapt and drop some of those, but we continued with remote work and, and this type of research as much as possible. And it's been quite successful so far. Very interesting. Thank you. And um, you've, I want to touch it on a slightly different topic now. You've recently joined a, a panel of global uh, localization experts for Vistatech's uh, uh, unique World UX Roundtable hosted by our, our very own uh, Maria Jesus de Arriva Diaz. And, uh, and you were joined uh, alongside, you know, global UX experts from Dr. Alia, Line Plus Corp, uh, Aura, Verizon Connect, and you offer tips on delivering more than just out of the box localized uh, user experiences. So uh, this included, for instance, learning why it is key to bring these three elements together, uh, visualizing what an ideal word UX would look like, amongst others. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit more, and for anyone who didn't get uh, the chance to join that uh, round table, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, we so we discussed a, a number of things, and definitely uh, the panel has has had quite a, a lot of very relevant um, observations around this. I guess that some of the key points um, around it, and and one of the things that I discussed as well was um, the fact that localization is quite often um, just seen as content, and from a UX perspective, that is very dangerous for a lot of products, um, not just because of the cultural adaptations that have to go into it, but if you look at it from the perspective of who would be using a website, for instance, which are becoming increasingly standardized, mm -hmm. content matters quite a lot, but uh, you basically want to be inclusive to as many audiences as you can, because a lot of the times, for example, if you translate a, a website, it is just changing imagery, changing text, and that seems enough but there are different um, relevant changes that you have to make, like right to left script. You have to make sure that things are in a familiar position because um, there are different habits, even on a market level um, to where menus sit and where uh, links sit. Um, and most um, importantly, for example, uh, semiotic aspects like icons, um, things that might seem very obvious to a certain audience are not going to be that way to another audience. So I've done quite a bit of research uh, into this in the past uh, for my book. And um, one of the things that definitely can, comes to the fore every time that we talk about localization is that it's, it's not seen as part of UX by a lot of companies, mm -hmm. which is a, a huge mistake. Um, primarily also because localization is UX at the end of the day. And also the companies themselves would benefit a lot more because it would reduce work downstream 
um, if localization had access and a stronger interaction with design right from the early stages, um, because it would save you know those last minute changes and a lot of time with with post release updates and this kind of thing. So definitely, a localization as an industry, I think, has to change its scope a little bit in order to be more assertive um, around uh, the experience of a product. And I think that there is uh, also similarly this aspect of UX that needs to be more open to inclusive audiences, be them inter domestic or international, and the role that localization plays in that. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's uh, very, uh, very wise word and interesting to see how that will play in the next few years, um, whether you know the pandemic has had an impact and uh, that will be one of the learnings that will be applied in the future. We'll just see that the industry will change itself um, with how UX um, uh, is, uh, with the way that UX is becoming uh, much, much more important and essential really. So now um, you're, you're very busy and I appreciate your time because I know that you also currently teach as well at Kingston University as a guest lecturer uh, where you support students with model coursework on UX research and guide and mentor final MA user experience projects. So can you tell us a little bit about it maybe? So I do support uh, students and give the odd lecture on research methods. It's immensely gratifying because key things around as a practice is that it's very easy to think that it's quite formulaic, that it's a monolithic term, that user experience is the one thing, and it's not. It's 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 composed of several different areas. So you have UX architecture, you have uh, service design, which is connected to that. You have UX, UX psychologists working. Um, it's an immensely rich field. And um, talking to students directly as they're learning about UX is really gratifying in a sense that UX that they can look into and that there's different aspects to designing an experience that is not just like putting pixels on the screen and just, and most importantly, and that's where the research angle is that you're supposed to be answering a need or, or resolving a problem. Um, and that's the, the whole thing about UX is um, you have to have a, a certain, this is what your product is supposed to handle, this is what it's supposed to do. And research is to help define that. It's supposed to help you to uh, need, this is the problem that they, that I have to explore. Um, so it's it's really uh, interesting also, to, because I deal with a lot of students from all around the world, that they bring their, um, their cultural, in, in order to think about, oh, this is something that I could be addressing in my country, or this is something that I could be building to help out a certain political or social cause. Yeah. Um, and it's really it's really uh, enriching to have that idea of, of uh, approaches to UX as well. That's very interesting. When you're telling me, you know, that you have students from all around the road, and I was just thinking in terms of age, just age itself, I assume you have students from various so backgrounds and different ages. Um, is, do you do you feel that um, I don't know if you have more of a the Gen Gen Z range uh, age range or is it uh, Gen Z Gen Y etc. and that that they bring you a different perspective you know from um, uh, a younger um, uh, user uh, perspective you know what I mean Spend, being much more um, familiar and aware of of uh, uh, of how to navigate online, basically, a comparison, if that makes sense, between different generations and how does that play uh, uh, working in UX? Yeah, so definitely, I think that everybody um, has, you know, in today's society, everybody has a, a degree of familiarity, at least with the internet and using online <laughs> services to one extent or another. You know, digital literacy is, is something that is uh, just, prevalent in all demographics. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I do get uh, students that are older and are in a continued learning um, program or just want to basically um, elevate their career. They, yeah. they want to, or even switch careers, yes. which, is, which is quite nice to, to see people who yeah. are fearless and just want to change regardless of the age. Mm -hmm. um, and there is, 
I would say that it's not so much the familiarity with the internet, but some, some, sometimes the usage that is yeah. given to it. Um, so social media is quite prevalent and there's, there's obviously, you know, in all demographics, you see this. Um, I would say that in terms of um, audiences, demographics, uh, internet um, usage only starts becoming an issue toward, you know, to very, very elderly demographics in particular. And that's why inclusiveness and accessibility is so important for them. Um, and should be a concern for every company anyway. Mm -hmm. But there are some differences in terms of the approach sometimes, but it's always, um, I think that's right now as we get older and older students because people have decided to get into uh, and are getting more um, motivation and, and more uh, drivers to continue learning throughout their lives that it's only a natural continuation of, of that trend that we get students from all ages and backgrounds. And mm -hmm. that's and that's a really wonderful thing. Absolutely, yeah, that, that is fantastic indeed. And um, so you just mentioned um, inclusiveness, inclusiveness, apologies. I wanted to jump back on this. Um, I understand Vodafone has several initiatives that include accessibility, diversity, inclusiveness, um, and especially with the past year uh, that has been so challenging for many of us and is still very much at the moment. Can you maybe expand a little bit on this? Yes, yeah, so Vodafone has um, developed a number of programs uh, over the, the last few months uh, and really since last year to help support people with COVID, including mm -hmm. um, bill support um, and obviously understanding the circumstances that people find themselves in. Um, we also have a number of programs around uh, COVID research. One of them is the Dream Lab app, mm -hmm. which is freely available to everybody. Basically, it's a collaboration with the Imperial, Imperial College London. Okay. Um, and the whole purpose of that app is to, uh, for those who would volunteer, uh, to use processing power in um, analyzing data uh, to search for COVID treatments, uh, find out correlations in data that could lead to new studies and deeper understanding of the, of the illness. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, the, the data aspect is quite important and we we uh, partner with not just with Imperial College but several other institutions as well in order to help understand and face uh, the consequences of COVID. So and apart from that of course um, there's a huge push in the company for inclusiveness and diversity. Um, we're actively trying to be uh, uh, one of the best places in the UK to work in for all um, for all types of uh, audiences and and employees, and it's it's all part of a bigger push to promote more humanity at the at the workplace level. So the, you don't normally see a lot of companies pushing for this that actively. So it's really gratifying to be working in the company that does that. Sounds fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And you also, um, I believe you mentioned your book earlier on that I wanted to uh, jump back on because um, uh, uh, I've had the chance to uh, to carry, to hold the first version in my hand uh, at the office that, uh, uh, that we ordered uh, and uh, that you might have mentioned probably at, at your, in your last um, presentation at Fingal Forum. So um, the book is called um, Author, uh, or Universal uh, UX, Building Multicultural User Experience. I believe you're working maybe on the second version, correct me if I'm wrong. The second edition, yeah. Second edition, sorry. And, and the book provides an ideal guide as multicultural UX uh, continues to emerge as a transdisciplinary field that in addition to uh, traditional UI and corporate strategy concerns, includes social, corporal um, and neurocognitive concerns that constitute one of the first steps in a truly global product strategy. So uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the book for anyone who didn't get a chance to see the first edition and we're curious and would like to see the, the new one soon? Uh, thanks for the plug-in for reading that blurbs. Um, it makes it sound a lot a lot better than than it is. Um, well, the the book really was written um, with an intent of capturing what I knew about localization and UX at that point, and bringing in some esteemed friends and and colleagues um, as well to provide um, 
evidence and examples of how UX was being practiced all over the world. Um, so there are different aspects to it. So obviously from a design perspective, you have to have certain cultural considerations, globalized, uh, globalized design is um, in itself a topic that maybe doesn't fit this podcast, but it's something that is quite relevant as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you think, for example, of the way that websites used to look in the 90s, right? Flashy, literally yeah. full of flash uh, technology, quite colorful. And we've come a long way since then. So that diversity kind of was lost throughout the, throughout the years, uh, but replaced with more usability, more streamlined, more standardized practices. Um, so the, the book was really around how do different cultures see user experience on a digital level? And you have Japan who is very specific in, um, in having several different uh, approaches to user experience mm -hmm. um similar in the in the far east there's there's different uh needs and requirements around uh digital experience and i think that obviously the field evolves and since the book was initially published i think there's quite a lot to catch up on you know with data leaks with um the way that social media has been shaping up some of the expectations around information and content um and the way that designers can respond to that and the way that different cultures see that so basically the second um version um or edition is meant to um capture what has happened since then and also complement that with uh, a healthy dose of what um i've learned about research ux research specifically in the meantime uh, because every every time Every every year you learn a little bit more, and sure. this is this is a, a way to also encapsulate that in in the guise of um, globalized UX practice. Absolutely, yeah, and this can very much help anyone uh, wishing to take their business global, improve their user experience, whether they're uh, it's themselves their own personal website or an organization. Speaking of this. Do you think that organizations understand more the importance of UX these days? You 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 talk about the difference of how how far we've come from websites that are flashy in the 90s to today, but there's still obviously a lot to learn and to work on. What's your view? I would say say from a from a user um, researcher um, uh, expert perspective. Thank you for the kind words. Um, definitely companies have a much more integrated perception of what their digital uh, presence is supposed to to represent. Um, it's, it's common to say that you don't really exist unless you have a website. I think that that's kind of being replaced by you don't really exist unless you have a social media profile sure. in different in different sites, actually. Um, so the way that companies are thinking about their digital presence is key and COVID has accelerated a lot of that mm -hmm. as well. Um, so you, in seeing advertisements on the street, um, that's not the, the reality of advertisement um, at the moment, because if you want to reach an audience, you have to reach it through digital channels. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is really the future. So, in terms of uh, the websites and the way that we think about websites and apps, that's going to change quite a lot as well. So the app market has been in decline for a while now. The primary technical driver is that sites will become lighter and more streamlined and that mm -hmm. you can effectively use them like you use an app on yeah. your phone. And I think that companies are um, opening up to that particular um, future, let's say, of online presence. And right now, of course, social media is one of the key um, ways to show that, you know, you have a business and that you, and that you, the, how you address your customer base as well. Um, and it's becoming more diversified as well in the sense that uh, you have a lot of competition in nearly every single industry. Sure. So having the best digital presence gives you that edge and that's what companies are striving for now so definitely we've come a long way and i think that we're still we're still in the start of something that will be even more streamlined will be even more integrated with our lives in the future 
Absolutely, yeah. And for individuals and organizations uh, wishing to get started on their UX journey uh, and maybe and provide a better experience for their users, um, do you have any tips maybe? Uh, can you share real life tips or uh, what, what's your vision maybe for the future? What would help? So regardless of the position that you're in or even in terms of the company structure, um, I, my first recommendation would be to talk to customers. Um, have uh, a listen to what people are saying about your product or your website or what's or what specifically you work on. Um, get their feedback, be open and bring this back to the product teams. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have that open channel, use it to instruct what you are doing because ultimately a company's success is reliant on what their customers feel or how they feel about your product. Absolutely. So UX is nothing else other than trying to deliver something that matters to people. Mm -hmm. So you have to start with that. You have to start with people. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go into UX, don't also don't think that it's just UX design um, because UX is basically everything that comes um, to the to the audience that mm -hmm. is shown to the customer. So there are different aspects, even if you're just working on, you know, even if you're just a tester or if you're a localizer or if you're a copywriter, regardless of what domain you work on, you contribute to that final user experience. So to gain more, more empowerment within the process, um, just establish more contact as well with the other teams and understand what they are struggling with. Because oftentimes teams, they want to deliver uh, good things, but they're not always allowed or there's time constraints or there's budget or it's always a, a struggle of some sort that compromises the end result. In talking to them as well, you will understand those better and be as close as possible to designers as well. Uh, if you're not a designer yourself, um, you know, take them out for coffee, offer them some. Obviously not the moment if you're in lockdown or if you're unable to see them physically. For sure, but <laughs> yes, virtual virtual coffee. Just um, establish a relationship. You know, uh, try to learn. Um, if you don't know enough, or if you feel that like you don't know enough about UX, learn by absorbing it from the people that do. And the most important thing is just to be motivated on an individual level. But from an organizational point of view, if you're working in anything that reaches the customer, you are in UX. So, talk to the customer, bring that those insights back to the business and just um, start there in order to find your place more and more thoroughly um, settled in the workflow. Thank you, very wise words. <laughs> I'm sure very useful for uh, anyone listening. And um, well, before we end this interview, what's on the horizon for you? So apart from this uh, second edition of the book that is uh, taking a bit of time, um, also preparing a course, um, an online course on research methods, uh, which will be around UX um, research, but really it will be focusing a lot on how do you talk to customers mm -hmm. and how do you how do you work with data from different sources as well. And also I have, uh, a lot of um, papers and articles that need basically to be finished. So I'm also preparing those over the next six months. Um, so hopefully uh, most of this will see the light of day next year. Well, very busy uh, uh, rest of 2021 for you, I see. <laughs> and uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today before we end this interview? Just that um, if you want to reach out, I can be easily found at LinkedIn. Um, my email is alberto at synthetia.world. So if you have any questions, uh, hit me up for a conversation on UX anytime. Um, and also if you want to check out some, some ideas uh, behind UX, uh, feel free to uh, check out the book. I think that it's available on Google Books. Um, I don't make a dime with it anymore. So you know, feel free to read it. Um, and yeah, just to, as a general message, if you're even remotely interested in UX and how to link up localization with UX, um, the best lesson that I've learned from all these years of uh, changing practices is that um, you just have to be curious 
and have use that as your driver and be persistent really um and keep learning it's the one thing that keeps us growing as well absolutely well thank you so much alberto it was a pleasure to have you on the show i've learned a lot i'm sure our audience will learn a lot you might get a few emails you never know <laughs> Pretty sure you will get uh, you'll get a few questions, and uh, we look forward to um, well um, publishing this interview that you can uh, find uh, on video or on audio. Uh, so thank you again. Good, thank you very much. Pleasure okay. to be here. So um, it's already the end of today's show with Alberto Ferra, who um, is the user research manager at Vodafone. So please make sure to tune in again to listen or watch uh, our next Vista Talk show, where we'll be discussing more interesting topics with interesting people from all around the world. <laughs>